York show. It is Saturday, April 29th, 2023, and we are here for a, spe a very special purpose and with one of our esteemed scholars, Dr. Charles Finch, who is who is an Egyptian scholar and author, researcher. Hotep, my brother, how are you doing today? Hotep to you, I'm doing just fine. I'm, I'm, Absolutely. I'm always happy about Okay, hold on. Your signal's breaking up a little bit. Okay, you say you're always happy about what? Uh, the fact that my, my health is good. Oh, absolutely. That your health is good. Well, health is wealth. So we have to understand that, brother. And as we get older, I'll be 52 in June of this year. So as we get older, yes, you know, health is wealth. Well, um, yeah. hey, you and I would talk. Go ahead. You are a young boy. You're 52? You're, you're yeah, you're 52 a, June seventh. You, you're a young boy. <laughs> uh, you, you ain't <laughs> by more than 20 years. Right, right. Yeah, well, Dr. Little Jeffries is one of my teachers, and he calls me a youngster. You know, yeah, so. <laughs> I said, yeah, Dr. J, I'm 51. He said, You're a youngster. Yeah, yeah just okay. Do. So, yeah. So uh, for those that don't know, um, well, want to go Dr. Charles well, Finch and I, we, we were talking because, on Facebook and we'll okay, let him go ahead and get, okay, we'll let him get get straight on that side. But um, Netflix, um, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith through Netflix has a new documentary series called African Queens. Uh, the first installment that was released dealt with uh, Queen and Zynga of uh, uh, Matamba, which is modern day Angola. And we talked to one of my teachers, Professor James Small about that because he was one of the consultants on that project. The second installment in the series deals with Queen Cleopatra the seventh uh, of Egypt. And the trailer has been released recently. Now the actual um, installment airs May 10th. So all people have seen is a two minute trailer, but the trailer has been receiving a lot of backlash from uh, some of those in in Egypt, descendants of Arabs, uh, about the depiction of Queen Cleopatra yeah. VII. So they have they have uh, African American actress Adele James uh, portraying uh, Cleopatra, and recently the director uh, for this installment, Tina Garavi. Um, did wrote a wrote an article for variety.com and i'll pull up the article here in just a minute uh and she asked the question what bothers you so much about a black cleopatra so um do, uh, dr charles finch i know you were commenting on this on on facebook and commenting about the complexion of of uh what cleopatra would have looked like etc so I, I wanted you to weigh in on this conversation and last week when we interviewed uh tony browder my friend and your friend tony browder author of now valley contributions to civilization browder mentioned your name the number of times in that interview so i said well we got to have dr charles finch on the show as well so go, go ahead and, and and give us your take um on on this whole controversy and then i know you want to bring in the historical context as well yeah. okay can you hear me go ahead yeah it, it, uh, you are breaking up too you kind of come in and you go out i don't know how what to do about that you okay in and out. Um, okay okay so can you hear me? go can you hear me? yeah i can hear you i can hear you go ahead and Tell people what is your perspective on this debate on Cleopatra and uh, share with us the historical information you wanted to share to put this in a historical context as well. There is no debate. <laughs> there is none. Cleopatra <laughs> was descended from. Ptolemies were Ptolemies. Who were the Ptolemies? Ptolemy was one of Alexander's conquests. Right. And 
uh, the, the the native Egyptians there happy for him to conquer Egypt. Why? Because at that time, under the domination Persians, and they, they hated the Persians. The Persians just treated them like slaves. And they were happy to welcome and assist Alexander uh, in his conquest of Egypt because uh, he got rid of the uh, Persians, all right? Uh, completely, right. forever. Uh, anyway, the inherited the I'd say from Alexander. Alexander died young. Mm -hmm. He was in his early. Uh, he divided his empire among his generals, and, and the general general name call L-E-M-Y. Um, he inherited or was he took over Egypt and, and for the next 300 years and his descendants excuse me ruled Egypt. Cleopatra of the last Ptolemy. All right. Um, now, now what happened right. was um, he was extremely dynamic and, and intelligent and uh, and had her own I don't know if you want to call it ambitions or at least her own ideas about how Egypt should be ruled why was that an issue <clears throat> because strictly speaking it was supposed to descend to a man but her brother <clears throat> at the time that Ptolemy died passed on was like nine, nine years old Right. Anything yeah. else. And so Cleopatra, who was older, she was like 17 or 18, wasn't very, very older herself, uh, ruling Egypt. And little by little, really assumed all, all of the power uh, that that entailed. Now, by, by that time, um, Egypt was under the control. Well, let me see. Yeah, the Ptolemy coming under the control more and more of the Romans. Okay, and this is yes. this is where the drama of Cleopatra has made such an impact. Because those Romans included who? Caesar and Mark Antony. Yep. Julius Caesar and yes. Mark Antony. Right. Both of them. <laughs> Caesar just fell total spell when he conquered Egypt. All right, and uh, not only so, not only was he willing to share power with her uh, in Egypt. Oh my goodness! There are those who think that uh, the assassination of Julius Caesar was at least in part motivated by his relationship with Cleopatra because it looked like for all intents and purposes, he was going to make Cleopatra empress of Rome. Okay. It looked like he was going and to make Cleopatra empress of Rome. That, okay. That is all right. And while we um, try to get his connection, um, while we try to get this connection reestablished here and increase the signal strength. Um, some of you all uh, saw me on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Some of you all saw the broadcast that I did uh, Sunday night on the African History Network show where we dealt with this topic. This is one of the articles we talked about. Queen Cleopatra, director, speaks out what bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra. This is from Variety.com. This is written by Tina Garavi who is the director of uh, this installment of African Queens, okay? Uh, we've got Joya watching us um, and uh, a number of people watching us. Now, let me give you some background information on Dr. Charles Finch. Um, Dr. Charles Finch was until June 30th, 2007, director of international health at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, he is a 1971 graduate of Yale University. 
uh, and a 1976 graduate of Jefferson Medical College. So he is a medical doctor. He completed a family medicine residency at the University of California Irvine Medical Center in 1979. Uh, Dr. Fence joined the Department of Family Medicine at the Morehouse School of Medicine in 1982, and then the Office of International Health in 1989. Okay, eventually becoming the principal investigator of a traditional uh, of a traditional healer survey among the uh, Sarah people of Senegal in 1991, 1992. Now, Dr. Finch has conducted independent studies in African antiquities, comparative religion, anthropology and ancient science in 1971. Since 1982, Dr. Charles Finch has published more than a dozen articles including the african background of medical science and and science and symbol in egyptian medicine okay okay go ahead and uh so dr finch i want you to go ahead and you were explaining queen cleopatra and you left off saying that um uh you left off saying that uh people feared some people feared that julius caesar would make her empress of of rome if i remember correctly you were saying uh the romans at least the roman senate was totally opposed to uh um cleopatra assuming any position of power in rome itself okay and so that was at least in part it is said for the assassination of julius caesar and <clears throat> Once that happened, she got she left Rome, uh, and she and she she didn't come by herself. She had herself she had her own little fleet, and she went back to Egypt. And who was there in Egypt? Or who followed her? Because uh, uh, he had already established contact with her in uh, Rome was none other than Mark Antony. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so she reestablished her place in Rome uh, with Mark Antony at, by her side. But uh, the problem with that was that Mark Anthony was married. He was married to a Roman woman. I think the woman he married was actually related to Augustus Caesar. Mm. Now, <clears throat> Augustus Caesar was the nephew of, um, of Julius Caesar. And um, so already there was a, potent, there was, uh, a potential source of conflict between uh, Augustus Caesar and Mark Antony. Okay. Now, what exacerbated that was Mark Antony's uh, infatuation with Cleopatra. It is said that all Cleopatra had to do was look in your eyes of a man to captivate him. <laughs> hmm. And she was not old. She was, she was like in her late teens, early 20s. Right. And these men, these uh, Mark Antony and Julius Caesar, were each one of them old enough to be her father. They were in their 40s, 50s even. So, um, but that was Cleopatra. She had this aura, this lure, and <clears throat> she was ambitious to the nth degree in the sense that she wanted to reestablish uh, the independence of Egypt insofar as possible with her at the head of state uh and she did everything and and part of her and not part of her her <clears throat> her tech and was what i want to say her uh strategy for doing that was to shall we say enrapture julius caesar on the one hand and mark antony on the other and each one of them fell into her uh, you know like i said fell under her spell you might say right. one by one and um, she, um, what kind of, she, especially after Julius Caesar was assassinated, she went back to Egypt. And uh, my, I don't know whether Mark Antony actually followed her or was with her or was in Egypt. No, I think he followed her or maybe was even with her when she went back to Egypt to reestablish her reign and her rule. But <clears throat> the problem is, the problem for her design, shall we say, her ambition was none other than Augustus Caesar, who was Julius Caesar's uh, nep nephew. Okay. Um, 
And Augustus in Latin means great, all right? Right. Um, greater power, powerful. And he got that, uh, he gave himself that name. In fact, our month, August, uh, is named after him. Right, Augustus okay? Caesar, right. Um, so, um, anyway, he, um, fought, so there was this, uh, there was this incipient conflict between Augustus Caesar on the one hand, Mark Antony on the other, and Mark Antony uh, allied with um, uh, uh, Cleopatra. Okay. Now, the and and what made it worse, as I've already said, is that Mark Antony was married to a Roman woman, already married, and if I'm not mistaken, I think she was the sister or a relative of Augustus Caesar. So his dalliance, well, it was more than a dalliance, his infatuation with Cleopatra was an insult, apart from anything else, and it was considered dangerous to uh, the empire, the Roman Empire. Hold on, I just need to, my throat is getting dry, so let me just take another drink. Okay, no problem. And for those just joining us, we're speaking with Egyptian scholar Dr. Charles Finch, uh, and we're talking about Cle uh, Queen Cleopatra the Seventh, the last pharaoh, and there's been a lot of conversation about Queen Cleopatra and her ethnicity or what today people may call race or being mixed race, whatever, it, however you want to frame it. Because of the documentary series from Jada Pinkett Smith, uh, the installment that comes out May 10th dealing with Queen Cleopatra and mm -hmm. African-American actress Adele James is portraying Queen Cleopatra. You know, we talked about this on the African History Network show this past Sunday. OK, go ahead, Dr. Finch. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, let's get to that. Okay, go ahead. There's absolutely no doubt, and make and, and it makes me grit my teeth. Okay. And the main person in front of this is Zai Hawass. Oh yes. Who is the uh, leader, the uh, chairman of the Department of Antiquities? He's an Egyptian. Mm -hmm. And um, the one thing you can say about Cleopatra, yeah, her on her paternal line, father's line, she was Macedonian or Greek, if you will. Right. right? But her mother was Egyptian uh, because the uh, Ptolemies, like I already mentioned the Ptolemies. Right. And the Ptolemies who ruled, who were given Egypt, you might say, after Alexander died. And so there was a line of about, ooh, 12 Ptolemies. Or more, yeah, something like that. And Cleopatra was in that line mm -hmm. uh, through her father. Um, but Cleopatra, so uh, uh, what can I say? The so the Ptolemies ruled for about 300 years after um, Alexander right. died. And the last Ptolemy would be Cleopatra herself. And she, uh, she, was, uh, she was just taking the, shall we say, the bull by the horns, if we could say that. Right. And she established herself as ruler over Egypt. In fact, she was ruthless. She got rid of her brother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, took a minute, took a while, but she got rid of him. She could not tolerate anybody or anything that would stand in her way of absolute rule. And she had absolutely no qualms about seducing Caesar on the one on the one hand, excuse me, Mark Antony on the other. And for her, it was simplicity itself. She was a fascinating woman, you know, um, fascinating. You know, she had a uh, I don't know what else to say it. Uh, fascinating, and she had the the means to fascinate the men uh, around her. Right. But let's get back to her ethnicity, and okay. we'll continue. She, as I say, she was half Egyptian. What I mean, her mother was Egyptian. Uh, her father was Macedonian. Now, as I say, uh, there are um, Egyptians today who, like uh, Zai Hawass, yes, uh, who who is a uh, uh, the, who is the director of the Department of Antiquities, who will uh, who absolutely and totally angrily reject any idea that Cleopatra was mixed race. Because that's what it means, you know, right. to say that her mother was Egyptian. The Egyptians, the native Egyptians, were basically descended from Africans. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to see who the ancient Egyptians looked like, I'm not talking about the Egyptians. See, now the Arabs invaded 
Egypt in the 7th century AD. Right. Okay. 7th century AD. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, Zahi Hawass is trying to say that the ancestors of the Arabs were the rulers of Egypt. Right. No. No. Right. Absolutely not. Right. That's that. That is just an egregious lie. Okay. Um, now, the uh, history of ancient Egypt, of, the, of dynastic Egypt, let's not say ancient Egypt, dynastic Egypt, uh, goes back to 4000 BC. Mm -hmm. And because, why was Egypt called the, the two lands? That was one of their own names for themselves, because Egypt at one time had been, uh, well, Upper Egypt was, the so uh, was Southern Egypt. Uh, lower Egypt was Northern Egypt, okay? Um, and that's the reason why the, they called Egypt the two lands. They were united, united by the man who became the, the first identifiable pharaoh by the name of Menes. Right. And he united the, the two lands uh, into the country that we historically came to know as Kemet, or Egypt. But that isn't when Egypt actually started. Okay. okay? Um, you know, the ancient Egyptians, I'm not going to say what the ancient Egyptians said about their own country. Now, I'm not, you can either t take it or leave it alone, I'm, but this is what they said. They said their history went back to 55,000 BC. Wow. 50,000 years, 50,000 years prior to the historical period. Now, you know, you, you, can, uh, you can accept or reject that, but that's what they, that's what they said about their own country. Nonetheless, um, there's a book by... Uh, Robert Bovall and Graham Hancock. Oh, uh, I have the book. I don't have. I don't want to stop what I'm saying to go get it. Okay. But the book is about the Sphinx. Now, what does the Sphinx have to do with any of this? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, uh. Here on my cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if you, if you, the Sphinx sits in a. I don't want to call it a ditch, but a, a excavation. All right. Okay. It's excavation, and uh, oh, first of all. Let me say this about the Sphinx, and then we'll keep going. Okay. The Sphinx nose that you see, if you went there today, Egypt, the nose has been blown off. Who, do you, who, did, who blew the nose off? Napoleon. Okay. Why? Because it was, and I have to, I'm going to use this word with quotation marks, it was a fully Negroid nose. Mm -hmm. Couldn't tolerate it. He actually blew it off. And the nose that they blew off is sitting in the Louvre Museum in Paris today. The nose that they blew off. Okay. Now, yes. Now, let me ask. Let me ask a question. Now, was the so in Nile Valley contributions to civilization by Tony Browder? He cites sketches of. He talks about how the okay. the nose was okay. deteriorating over maybe hundreds of years or something something like that so uh, okay say it again say it again got oh, 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 okay. just a second there. repeat yeah. what you just said yeah in, in now valley contributions to civilization tony browder talks about how the uh he cites sketches of uh of the sphinx and he talks about how the nose was deteriorating over time now is it is was it deteriorating was the nose deteriorating prior to napoleon shooting the nose or was it was was the nose totally intact not deteriorating and it was napoleon who solely destroyed the nose do you or do you yes, know I, I think that i think that's a be, uh, that is a more accurate um depiction of what actually happened which one? i think the nose because if you go and see see that like i said they, they didn't they didn't uh lose or get rid of the nose the nose you could actually i don't think they show it but mm -hmm. it's sitting there in the paris museum undisturbed okay and un unaffected so um um and, and like i said why he couldn't tolerate the idea that this was again a negro and i have to use that word so you know exactly what i mean so there's no ambiguity of what i'm talking about when we're talking about the sphinx okay right, now wait a minute I, I haven't even gotten to the best part okay <laughs> okay hancock and boval actually started studying you know, uh, it, 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 you know, they dug out, not a, I won't call it a ditch, an, exca yeah, an excavation down about almost six feet where they actually constructed the Sphinx in front of the uh, second pyramid of Giza. Okay. But if you look at it, 
the way Bo- Hancock and Boval did it, you see levels of clay going down from the, uh, the top, from the surface of the ground, all the way down to the, 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 the base of where the, of, uh, of where the, the uh, Sphinx sits. And you can see different levels of, of uh, soil. I say clay, but soil and clay. And, and uh, Hancock and Boval says, those, you can uh, date those levels, okay? You, right. you, you, you know, you know, you can date those levels all the way down to the basic, to the, um, what do you want to say, to the foundation, all the way down to the base of the Sphinx. You know how far they go back? How far? 10,000 years. Wow, okay. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, 10,000 10, years. So the, if the Sphinx is that old, because they had to, they had to excavate around the Sphinx, uh, not around, they had to excavate uh, to, to actually uh, construct the Sphinx in the way that they did. Mm-hmm. And that, was, that went <laughs> 10,000 years. That's the reason why my new book is going to be called uh, Nile Valley Civilization, a 10,000 year history. Because right. to have built the Sphinx, uh, something like the Sphinx uh, would require a civilization equal to the task. Okay, something like the Sphinx. Even if you just see pictures of the Sphinx, you know exactly um, the truth of that. Right. So the Sphinx... <laughs> So the Sphinx, so I mean, what has been happening is just that Egyptologists, uh, Sean, uh, it, was a, um, it was a French linguist by the name of Jean Paulion, mm-hmm. who went to Egypt and was, was the first European, anyway, to decipher the hierog- so-called hieroglyphics, the hieroglyphic language of the um, Egyptians, and launched Egyptology as a discipline. Right. And but what happened is that when it became <laughs> when they could read now the literature and the inscriptions in the Egyptian language, the, the inscriptions that were carved out of the walls, the papyri they could find, the clay tablets, they began to realize that this was a fantastic, fabulous civilization, which even up in eight by eighteen twenty had not been. Uh, exceeded or excelled. Now the Greeks, you know, people talk about the Greeks. I don't have any problem with the Greeks because the Greeks recognized the primacy of ancient Egypt and said so. Right. Especially Herodotus. Right. Herodotus says, "Don't tell me about what the you know." He was a Greek. Now he, he himself was a Greek. He said, ah, "Don't tell me about what the Greeks did. The Egyptians did it all first, and they're the ones that taught the Greeks." Mm-hmm. This is Herodotus talking. Correct. And, uh, and, you know, because Herodotus is the so-called father of history. Right. Now, I, um, so uh, let's get back to Cleopatra for a minute. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, kind okay. of jumping around a little bit. <laughs> Cleopatra was far more, shall we say, proud, far more committed to her Egyptian ancestry through her mother than to her Ptolemaic one, through her father. I mean, I'm not... I mean, I, I, maybe I'm overstating that a little bit, but not by much. Okay. Because she, wanted, like I said, she considered herself someone, an heir of the pharaohs. She considered herself basically an Egyptian pharaoh. Now, there had been four previous, uh, three or four previous female pharaohs in Egyptian history, going all the way back to the first dynasty. Hatshepsut being one. Right. Uh, that's well known. And there, there have been a few others. There were uh, three others. And Cleopatra considered herself in that same line. She didn't consider herself a mere queen. Mm-hmm. She, uh, now, now, by the way, you know, there was, as you know, there was a brother-sister marriage among the uh, um, royalty of ancient Egypt. I think she may have even married her brother uh, so that she could uh, put herself in a position of power. But sooner or later, he, he was gotten rid of. Right. Cleopatra was ruthless like, like that. You know, uh, but she was she's extremely dynamic, though. And as I said, she knew how to wrap, uh, you know, and men just kind of, uh, you know, she wrapped them around around her little finger, as they said. And, and, yeah, and you know what happened when Augustus, you know, as we know, it was Julius Caesar that came first. Right. And she wrapped him around her finger. 
Then Mark Antony came second. She wrapped him around her finger and and, uh, and, and destroyed his marriage. And then, um, and then you know he eventually committed suicide mm -hmm. because Augustus, the fleets of Augustus had defeated his fleets, his, his military arm, and he committed. A, and and also Cleopatra had 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 fled the field of battle, and he just became totally dispirited, and uh, and he was just he went back to he went to go back to Egypt, literally. And I, this scene sounds melodramatic, but. So he could die in the arms of Cleopatra, if you can imagine that. Right. <laughs> yeah, you know, this, this seems all very, you know, hokey and made up in Hollywood and movie, but it happened. Yeah, it sounds it like happened. a movie, but yeah, it did. And he committed suicide. She committed suicide as well. Um, yeah. She dies in 30 BC. Um, so you, you mentioned her mother now from some research on this. Is believed her mother was Cleopatra the fifth. Is that correct? No, I don't think. No, uh, I um, I haven't seen that. Okay. All I've ever heard or seen is that her mother was Egyptian. Okay. And, and then, by the way, Zahi Hawass yeah. just rejects that. Now, Not that he has any reason for objecting for it, but he wants to uh, remove all traces of Africa from uh, from at least from the dynastic land of, line, line of ancient Egypt. Okay. So, okay. so let me... Oh, wait, wait. wait. Oh, there's ahead. one other thing I want to go say, and then, then, then we can get to questions. One is, <laughs> when Augustus finally, you know, he, con he, just, he conquered the uh, Marcus, Mark Antony. Mark Antony committed suicide. Augustus came uh, to Egypt to take over, you know, the empire. But you know what he wouldn't do? What? he wouldn't look Cleopatra in the eye hmm. because by that time she had such a reputation that he was afraid of getting hypnotized by her. Right. If you can imagine that, right. He would not look her in the eye. And it was after that encounter with Augustus that the famous story that Shakespeare and everybody else sort of repeated, she took an asp, which was a cobra mm -hmm. and she had the, she actually took it in her hand and had it had it sink its fangs in, into her. Can you imagine? Right. <laughs> she had a he had a flair for the dramatic, that's for sure. And she died that way. Right from the snake. Bite. Uh, I'm sorry. From a snake bite. Yes, from the snake bite. And um, um, you know, she was. <laughs> she's probably a lot of people consider her the most fascinating woman in history. Well, you know, I mean, you could argue, you could say yes or no, act, you know, you could argue about that. But, you know, she managed to, she came real close to to uh, uh, ruling Rome and the Roman Empire. Right. Through the two men that she just completely entranced. Julius Caesar on the one hand, Mark Antony on the other. And Augustus said, no, I, I, you know, if I, if I go back, you know, Augustus came and took over the empire and, and defeated Mark Antony and he committed suicide and all this. And Augustus knew better when he finally confronted Cleopatra, he would not look her in the eye. Right. So he was afraid of getting, he was afraid that, um, that she was going to mesmerize him hypnotize him <laughs> okay. what can i say so so let me let me try to put a fine point on this because i know we've run out of time and, and i want you to talk about your new book as well okay now um you said that uh on her on her mother's side you said her mother was egyptian now the yeah. period of time that we're talking about first of all uh the greeks invade uh under alexander the greek in 332 bc and they conquer uh -huh. conquer in 323 bc OK, mm -hmm. now, uh, um, uh, Queen Cleopatra, Cleopatra the seventh is born in 69 B.C. Now, this is uh -huh. this is about 700 years before the Arab invasion. That uh -huh. starts in 639 A.D. Now, when you say that her mother was Egyptian, what, what at, th at this point in time in 69 B.C., after after the uh you had the uh the persians invading you had the persians who already invaded you had the greeks who have invaded and the greeks have been there for uh, a few hundred years when we say egyptian in 69 black BC, black i know what you're like? getting at no still yes. black still black people still black people they just they, they didn't stop being black people 
Okay. So, you know, those, those people, um, you know, that, that you, those different conquerors, they came and they ruled at this, uh, you know, they, they ruled the empire or the, the country of Egypt. All right. Mm -hmm. But they didn't change who the people were. Okay. And in fact, they, each one of them would take uh, an Egyptian wife and or concubine, shall we say. Right. But they, they didn't change who the people were. They, they, re, re, they remained black people right up until, until the time of the Arab invasion, which was, as you say, in the 7th century A.D. Right. When that, after that, there, you know, and you already mentioned them. You're right. The Persians, mm -hmm. the Greek Macedonians, the Romans, and the Arabs, finally. And the Arabs came in droves to right. Egypt. It, in droves. And, and what, what I heard historically about the Ptolemies is that they would uh, either marry or intermix with a, a black Egyptian woman. Yep. Okay. The answer to that is absolutely. Yes. Absolutely true. So, as I say, there is a strong mixed race, I guess the only way I can put it, right. element in Cleopatra's history. And uh, as I say, her mother was known, was, uh, was an Egyptian. So, yeah. When you, that that picture of her that uh, Jada Pinkett Smith is going to use, or the actress? Yes, that's right. I, I, you know, you, I, you you know, don't listen to uh, Zahi, Zahi Hawa. Let Zahi him was, let, yeah. let let him uh, foam at the mouth about the fact that a black woman is representing uh, Cleopatra. That's 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 his issue. Now, I've been to Egypt, uh, I think, a dozen times, and I've interacted and spoke with Egyptians, mm -hmm. uh, including what a year and a half ago. Not all of them. Not all of them take that attitude that uh, Zai Hawass does. Right. And so, especially since when so many of them, not not so many of them, but a number of them have been um, have have been the guides for tour guides that were led by people like Asa Hilliard mm -hmm. and others who schooled them. Say, so, look, you know, I mean, taught them uh, John Henry Clark, even Doc Ben Yochanan, and. Uh, the, and they once once they were schooled, they accepted it. They weren't like us. Uh, but Zahi Hawass is just you know he's 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 he lost his mind. Right, and he's he going can't take it. He, he for whatever reason he cannot he cannot accept the, he cannot accept that historical reality. Right, you know what is it? What do you do? You know, there's nothing you can do but, but somebody like him. But of course now he is in he is the one who uh, is in charge of Egyptian antiquities. You know. Well, he um, just uh, he, he he he. I think he just resigned from that position or something. He uh, is not in that position anymore. He's about to go on a tour in the in the U.S. Right. starting in May uh, of, of, of the United States. Yeah, <laughs> of America. Now, here's what I would like to see happen. I don't know if it will or not. Mm -hmm. I would like there be a, a, a large, solid contingent of black people to attend every one of his lectures and presentations in every city where he goes. Now, will that happen? I, I don't know. Right. And when he starts talking what he talks, then he needs to be challenged. Mm -hmm. He needs to be challenged. Yes. I, I, I know about that upcoming tour. Right. Uh, I don't know if he's coming to Atlanta or not, but uh, you know, he, uh, he's making a, he's making, I think he's supposed to be here for at least three weeks. Yeah. If I make it, I'm not not if I'm not mistaken, but we'll you know now what will happen? I'm going to ask my friend. You already mentioned uh, Tony Browder. You call him Tony Browder. I call him uh, uh, Anthony Karakamoon Browder. As you yeah. know, he was one of the co-excavators of the temple tomb of uh, Karakamoon exactly. um, from the 25th dynasty. So I actually gave him that name. And when I talk to him, I say I say Karak. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have his book but anyway, also. Uh, dealing with finding right, uh, Karaka Moon, I have his book as well. So, yeah, uh, let, let, let me ask you this question. So, in, in the uh, article from Variety dot com, written by uh, Tina Garabi, Tina Garabi is the um, uh, director of this installment of African Queens from executive producer Jada Pinkett Smith that deals with uh, Cleopatra the Seventh. And in, oh. in the article, she says, um, "What the historians can confirm." is that it is more likely that Cleopatra looked like Adele James, actress Adele James, African-American actress Adele yeah. James, than Elizabeth Taylor ever did. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Now, and uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go, no, go ahead and finish. No. 
And let's, let's not even talk about the movie. Have you ever seen the movie Ten Commandments? Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yes. Know, Brandon, I, yeah, I've seen it. I, I've seen it since it was first came out when I was but a lad. I've seen it about three times. Right. The Egyptians didn't look a, like anyone in that movie. Right. Charlton Heston, Yul Brynner. Uh, uh, there was nobody that, in terms of their physical characteristics, looked like what the Egyptians would have looked like in the time of Moses. That would have been, what, 1300, 12, 1300 B.C., mm-hmm. a, lo- a little earlier. Right. There was nobody in Egypt looked like that. But, you know, this is Hollywood. Exactly. Now, I don't know why, you know, no, I, we don't have to get off into that too much. Right. But um, there's been a systematic attempt. Once they, like I said, when they began to realize just what Egypt had accomplished, there was a concerted effort to de-Africanize ancient Egypt. Yes. Still going on. Yes. Still going on. Yes. So further, further in the article, and there's one other quick article I, I want to just highlight that just came out Thursday also. And then I want you to talk about your book and we're going to give you a website address as well. Uh, so further in the article, Tina Garabi says, so was Cleopatra black? We don't know for sure, but we can be certain she wasn't white like Elizabeth Taylor. She says we need to have a conversation with ourselves about our colorism and the internalized white supremacy that Hollywood has indoctrinated us with. Because in the article, she talks about how Cleopatra being portrayed white somehow for some people increases her value or increases her Uh worth. Whereas portraying her as a melanated person who has some like black African ancestry somehow cheapens her worth, lessens her worth. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you see, I used to, I used to foam at the mouth this kind of stuff. I okay. used to grit my teeth and foam at the mouth and get angry and wanting to hurt people, whatnot. When you know when you would hear stuff like that, I, I I'm at the age now when what I do is laugh at them. Right. I right. laugh at these people. I laugh at the ideas. I laugh at what they're trying to say. Exactly. Uh, no, no, no. Cleopatra didn't look anything like uh, Elizabeth Taylor. Nothing. And Moses didn't look like anything like Charlton Heston. Right. And Ramesses the second didn't really didn't look like Jewel Jewel, Jewel Brenner. Brenner. Right. Jeez. Right, exactly. And this is this is uh, propaganda from 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 the media. Um why so in talking to you and coming up with the title for this uh, interview, you refer to Queer, uh, Queen Cleopatra as the last pharaoh, okay? Yeah. And and some people who I guess think they know about African history but really don't said said oh she wasn't a pharaoh or the last pharaoh was 600 years before that will happen why do you refer to cleopatra as the last pharaoh because that's how she thought of herself and that's how she what she called herself and that's in effect you know she did have egyptian ancestry yeah so she wasn't just a, a, a ptolemaic a macedonian right she kept and even the ptolemies got so that they de-emphasized their a Macedonian ancestry and increasingly Egyptianized themselves mm-hmm. and married into the local populace, as we've already seen. Right. So they considered themselves, they wanted to, they wanted to rule in the line of the Pharaohs. They weren't trying to be Macedonian King. They wanted to be thought of, they wanted to live like and be thought of as Pharaohs. And, and Cleopatra was no different. She, she was as far as she was concerned, she was an Egyptian. And therefore, she was a pharaoh. She she was a pharaoh, and she was either the fourth or fifth female pharaoh in Egyptian history, because there had been women pharaohs in Egyptian history. Right, exactly, exactly. Early, going all the way back to the all the way back to the first uh, the earlier dynasties. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, uh, lastly, there was this there was this article that just came out uh, Thursday, August twenty, uh, April twenty eighth. And uh, NBC News has this has this article. Zahi Hawass is quoted in it, of course. Uh, now, this one, um, this this contains a statement from the um, uh, Egyptian ministries, e- Egyptian Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities. But the name of this article is Cleopatra was not black. Egypt tells Netflix in growing feud ahead of new series okay and uh, i just want to highlight something here because it's important for us to have scholars like you 
and and others that push back on nonsense like this okay mm -hmm. um and in, in, in this article here let me bring it back up here uh just a second because i have it on the screen okay so it says that um uh queen cleopatra which is uh, which is released may 10th uh features adele james in the lead role a casting decision that the streaming giant netflix says is quote a nod to the centuries long conversation about the ruler's race end quote but but which officials in cairo have dismissed as quote blatant historical fallacy end quote blatant historical fallacy the government stated uh, the government statement uh, uh, from cairo the government statement uh issued thursday uh marked an escalation in a feud that has sparked demands for the show's cancellation amid a broader debate over representation in popular culture. So they go on to uh, uh, cite uh, the uh, Egypt's Ministry of Tourism and Antiquities argued that the documentary, uh, that the documentary nature of the feature quote, requires those in charge of its production to investigate accuracy and rely on historical and scientific facts, end quote. Um, they quote uh, Dr. Mustafa Waziri, uh, Dr. Mustafa Waziri, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities, said in the statement that Cleopatra's appearance in the show was, quote, a falsification of Egyptian history and a blatant historical fallacy, end quote. Uh, I know you've hit on it before, but for those just tuning in now, how, how would you respond to that? Besides getting mad, yes. angry, um, ready to go. I love to go face to face and chin to chin with any of these people. You know, it reminds me of the situation uh, of the Cairo Symposium in 1970. Yeah, that's right. 1974. Mm -hmm. When... Uh, uh, Shake on to Jope, yep. not Diab, Jope, Jope. and uh, Tailfield of Benga yes. uh, faced off against a, <clears throat> excuse me, a phalanx of European and, Egy and Egyptologists yes. about just this very issue. And after, after uh, this debate was concluded, the moderator debate says, well, only doctors Jope and Obengo came to this discussion, this debate, prepared to make their case mm -hmm. that the ancient Egyptians were, a black, were an African, black African race, and they won the day. Now, this is 1974. And they were, again, they were up against Europeans and, and uh, Arabs uh, who were trying to uh, remove all trace of Africa from the uh, ancient Egyptians. Can you imagine? They've been in Africa for uh, uh, thousands of years, and uh, they were trying to uh, um, they were trying to uh, deafganize Egypt. Still right. are. It still are. And um, oh, shoot, I would love to have. Uh, I would love to to renew that debate. Yes. Yes. We I would to. love. I would love to do that. We need to. And so and so with Browder, huh? Yeah, we need to. Um, now, your website is charlessfinch.com, charlessfinch.com. Yes. And uh, we'll bring your website here up on the screen. Tell people about your latest book. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. My latest book, I'm looking at it right now, Nile Valley Civilization, A 10,000-Year History, uh, A History of Ancient Kemet, from the point of view with a complete, shall we say, uh, rooting it where it's supposed to be rooted in Africa. Yes. Not just geographically, not just geographically, but racially, ethnically, culturally, in every central way. The ancient Egyptians, uh, okay, you know what the ancient Egyptians' name for their country was? Well, one was Kemet, one, and another was Tahiri. Okay, Kemet. Yes. And you know what Kemet meant? Land it meant the literally the black land. The black land. Of course. Now, what do your Egyptologists say? Oh, that, that's just a reference to the black soil, mm -hmm. except for one thing. 
they had a name for themselves, the Egyptians. You know what they call themselves? Kemiu, which means literally the blacks. Yes. So, um, like I said, up until uh, and up until the 19th century, nobody ever questioned the African origins of ancient Egypt. Okay. That was no, that was never an issue. Up until the 1800s, and the it was created century. by um, so-called scholars in Europe. Yes, and later on, in among the Arabs, to de-Africanize ancient Egypt. Boy, they they really are obsessed with de-Africanizing ancient Egypt taking the black out of ancient Egypt, right? except as, quote, as slaves. Now, if you want to see, um, I don't know, have you ever been to Egypt yourself? Not yet. Whoa. Oh, boy. When you do, yes. make sure you go down to Aswan, okay. where the dam is. Okay. There you will see the Nubians. Yes. That's who's there, the Nubians. They got put, they were, they were the original part of the original population of ancient Egypt. They got pushed south. Correct. By the Arabs, but they have taken their stand, so to speak, right there at Aswan. Right. And those people, once you see them, I said, those people are the remnants. I don't know, can I use that term? Mm -hmm. Are the continuation of ancient Egyptians. That's who the ancient Egyptians look like, and that's who they were. Right. Nubia was uh, derived from the ancient Egyptian word nub, which meant gold, right. because gold came from the south. And so the people, uh, and the, and were funneled into Egypt by the people we today call the Nubians, and that's what the Egyptians called them, the Nubians. Now, now was uh, uh, okay. I'm going to come back to Nubia in just a second. I know you have to run, so we're going to let you go here in just a minute. But um, Kemet, the translation for Kemet. Now you said that means land of the blacks or the black land, which we yeah, 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 the land of the black and the black land. That's Kemet. Yes. Okay, and but uh, but but the black land. So land of the blacks, because I know Browder talks about this in Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. He says it, it means the land of the blacks. But it's, re it's in reference to the complexion of the people, not the dark soil. No. OK, this is where the controversy comes in. OK, because there are those who say it's, it's a reference to both. But even if you uh, even if you say, OK, it's a, it just refers to the black land and the black land only. OK. And this is what I said earlier. Mm -hmm. But the ancient Egyptians called themselves Kemiu, Kemiu, which does mean literally the blacks. The blacks, okay. And it, they call themselves the black people mm -hmm. in reference to their complexion. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and you said now Nubia. Now, from my understanding, isn't Nubia derived from a Greek word? Um. Let me that, that's a not geez, let me see Nubia, Greek word. Huh. I'd have to now that I'd have to look up. Okay, just like I don't know that I I don't know I can't I don't know that it's Greek. Okay. Just like just like um, Ethiopia's doing. Oh I know let me, oh, okay. Let's just say this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm you know, not thinking straight. It is true the ancient Egyptians didn't refer to Nubia as Nubia. Right. They referred to Nubia as Kush. Yeah. Okay. And Kush became was uh the name of the nor also was the name of the northern third of the Sudan. Mm -hmm. And Kush and Egypt were partnered ethnically and geographically and often politically. Because even the you know what the Egyptians say about where they came from? They said they came from Horus and the follower brought his followers. This is what the Egyptians say: brought his followers to Egypt from the south. Right. This is what the Egyptians say. Right. The Everyone. followers of Horus came yeah. from the south. Right. And remember, south in Egyptian language was up. Mm -hmm. North was down or back. Right. Hindquarters. Now, why is that? Whereas the head was always. Uh, south, so you faced always faced south, right. as when you were looking toward um, this opposite of the way we look at it today. And the south was always first, chief, and up. Now, why was always. why was south up and north down? Because that's where they came from. 
Well, that's the, where they the, came the, from. The, 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 but the, also, the Nile River flows from south to north. Yeah, that. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you you made. I'm sorry. That's the point. You're absolutely right. right. That, that's even a stronger point that I should have made myself. No, it's okay. Because the, the Nile River uh, be, uh, started at, in the so-called Great Lakes and flowed from south to north. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, the Blue Nile, let me give me this right now, the Blue Nile joined, because the Blue Nile flowed from, from Ethiopia north into Egypt. And they joined, joined the White Nile from what is now Tanzania at uh, Khartoum in uh, the Sudan. And then flowed north as a single river. Okay. All right. Um, visit his website, Charles S. Finch, F I N C H dot com. Charles S. Finch dot com. There's a wealth of information there. Pre order his uh, new book. Um, this deals with. Uh, Nile Valley Civilization, uh, a 10,000 year history, and uh, much of what has been written uh, about African history and culture, uh, much has been written about African history and culture, and yet one will comb the vast literature nearly in vain for a complete and comprehensive survey of African civilizations by a single author. The uh, multi-volume, the multi-volume UNESCO General History of Africa One is in effect an, a, an anthology and while valuable and wide ranging suffers the limitations that all works of collective authorship do. Okay, so this um, is a fantastic new book. Uh, Tony Browder mentioned it last week. Uh, when 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 I had him on the show uh, and I said, well, we got to get Dr. Charles Finch on uh, uh, this week. So visit his website to pre-order this book now, Nile Valley Civilization, a 10,000 year uh, history. Um, how, how can people get in contact with you, Dr. Finch, if, if people want to bring you in to do lectures or uh, teach classes or anything like that? How, how can people <laughs> contact you? I, I'm trying to do a less and less of that. I, I don't like... I don't like traveling as much as I do anymore, but they should do it the way you did it. Okay. Um, email, email is probably the best way. Okay. And they can email yeah. you through the website. That's the way they I can prefer. contact you through, huh? through your website. They can contact you through your website also, right? Yeah, that's another. Yes, that's another way. Okay. Email or website. My email is Charles S. Finch at gmail.com. Charles, the one word, lowercase, Charles okay. S. Finch at gmail.com. All right. Well, look, brother, I know you have to run. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. And we worked through the technical difficulties. First, we had you on. Uh, we finally did, yeah. Via the internet, <laughs> and we could see you, but then the internet was acting up. So then he said, hey, can we do this by phone? So I said, okay, yeah, I'll call you through Skype. <laughs> it's technology. Mm. We have to understand how to navigate this technology to get the information out, brother, by any means necessary. All right. Well, I look, heard that. You, well, okay. you, you have a great day, man, and, and we'll talk soon. Thank okay? you. All right, brother. Hold tight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. Peace. All right. All right, everybody. That was uh, Dr. Charles Finch. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us today. We're going to be here for a little while longer because I teach my online history class uh, uh, today. You know, Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So don't go anywhere. We have more information for you. If you like this type of information that we provide at the African History Network, uh, you can support us. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, finance, finance the Sunday night show, the African History Network show that I broadcast on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. Uh, you know, I've been broadcasting the African History Network show for 13 years. Uh, seven years on 9, 10 a.m. WFDF. So we're on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Here's our PayPal cash app information right here on the homepage of our website. So if you want to support us, $10, $15, $25, $50, $100, dollars, whatever it is, it definitely helps. Uh, you can click right here for the cash app link as well as the PayPal link. This is our official cash app uh, account, dollar sign, the AHN show. Uh, and when you go to it, it'll say Michael and show my picture there. These other ones are fake African History Network cash app accounts. They're five 
that I have identified that have been stealing money from us, fake African History Network Cash App accounts. Our tag is uh, our Cash App tag is dollar sign the AHN show S H O W. If you type it in, make sure you type in the full tag because these other fake ones will show up before you type in, you know, the H O W. Okay, so that's why I put it right here and put our actual link here. I've contacted Cash App. They've opened an investigation as slow as Heinz Ketchup. And um, uh, it was last year that I opened up this investigation. I'm still trying to follow up on them. Uh, on Saturdays, I teach ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, where they didn't teach you in school. It's a 12-week online history course. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Okay, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. Um, so you can register for the class right now. As soon as you register, there's um, uh, you'll be able to join us uh, for today's class and you can go back and watch the previous classes also. OK, so we uh, deal with history, uh, thousands of years of history. Look at what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And uh, also uh, we, we look at uh, we go through now lots of transatlantic slave trade. We look at the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors as well. OK, so in this class, Saturday, April 29th. Uh, then on uh, the classes on sale, sixty dollars regularly, one hundred thirty dollars. On Sundays, I teach uh, Black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, eighteen hundred to nineteen sixty-eight. We go through and look at history chronologically. And this class will be uh, on Saturday, April thirtieth, uh, two p.m. to four p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Okay. We have a bundle pack. You can register for both of these classes for only $100. You can use this information with the children as well. I would say the information is PG-13. Um, so it's not overly graphic. We won't do a lot of cursing or anything like that. It's not crazy like that, okay? Uh, so you can register for the uh, class. And there's also, there'll be five of my lectures in the video library in digital format. So you get a bonus of five of my lectures also. Now. Uh, it took me, uh, I've been teaching this class on and off for uh, seven years, and I started teaching it back in uh, 2017. I've been studying history 31 years. You see me on Roland Martin Unfiltered. You see me on Faraji Muhammad Show, The Culture. Many of you all watch the African History Network show and been following us for years, even when I was on Blog Talk Radio. Um, so with this class, uh, this evolved out of a lecture that I did in January 2014 called Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And that was about seven years of research. Uh, that it was a four and a half hour lecture. But we can't start studying our history in slavery, even with transatlantic slave trade, which is important to study. We can't start in 1619 or in the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved. Uh, in, you know, in 1441 with Anton Gonzalez, we have to understand the history chronologically uh, and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors uh, who enter into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal in 711 AD. Now, uh, this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but it also deals with the uh, thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. August 20th, 2019 marked the 400th year anniversary of the 20 and odd Africans who came into Point Comfort in Virginia on August 20th, 1619 on the White Lion pirate ship, the White Lion pirate ship um, in what would later be called the colony of Virginia. Now, this year of 2019 was known as the year of return as many African-Americans were reconnecting uh, to Africa, especially West Africa, and traveling to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central, and South America, and have been in the land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years ago. Now, last week when we spoke with Tony Browder, author of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, and he's also uh, uh, the author of um, uh, Egypt on the Potomac and Finding Karakamoon, 
you know, he talked about the Olmecs and uh, Olmec culture as well. And we talked about the African origins, the African root of uh, uh, Olmec culture uh, being coming from ancient Kemet. Uh, we've interviewed Dr. Uh, David M. Hotep numerous times. And these are actual slides from the class, by the way. I put together the whole curriculum. Uh, there's about uh, 80 to 100 articles that we reference in this class. There's seven books that we use as reference. You don't have to buy any of the books. Uh, we show you uh, excerpts of the book on the screen, okay? But Dr. David M. Hotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence, it came out in 2011. On page 14 of his book, he deals with a discovery made in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004 by Dr. Albert Goodyear, Dr. Albert Goodyear. Um, evidence of a African presence 51,700 years ago uh, in Allendale County, South Carolina, okay? And people are asking for my email address. You can email me right through the website. Go to theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, and you can email me right through the website. Uh, also, we have the website up here on the screen. And then also you can email me as well at ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com, ahnshow at theafricanhistorynetwork.com. OK. All right. Now. Uh, they found Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. They found uh, 13 different types of evidence, 13 different types of evidence to thoroughly document an African presence in the land that we call the United States of America, going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, paintings, skulls, skeletons, structures, and tools. Okay, they found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in this country that we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. Okay, so uh, it's uh, totally ridiculous for people to think, especially for African Americans to think, that African people first came to this land as slaves, conquered and shackled by Europeans, okay? Uh, that's a total misunderstanding of history. Now, this is uh, a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's a white archeologist. This is an article from, uh, from, uh, sci from sciencedaily.com, sciencedaily.com that came out in November 18, 2004. The, the article is about 19 years old. It's still at sciencedaily.com. You can go back and uh, read it. It's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. Here's a, a summary of what the article says. Now, this is not my summary. This is the summary coming from uh, ScienceDaily.com. Radiocarbon, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old. Indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age, okay? So we have to ask the question, well, who were these humans, okay? Who, who was on Earth 50,000 years ago, 51,000 years ago, okay? The, and th these were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the uh, oldest DNA on the planet. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. They go all around the world. And they were also here in the land we call the United States of America. Now, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa, the Khoisan in Southern Africa uh, are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor 
according to the report. Now, here are a couple of Khoisan women. The, the Khoisan are the short-statured Africans, okay? Um, the Khoisan live mainly in southern Africa in territories spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, known as the Sans people, and keepers of the livestock, known as the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds, the click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. Okay, AtlantaBlackStar.com has a good article um, entitled Five Ethnic Groups That Prove the First Humans Were Black. Okay, and some of you will have seen the interview from um, April, from was it April 17, 2014, where I interviewed my friend Renoko Rashidi. And we were talking about um, Chevalier, Joseph Boulogne, and uh, the Moors and the Black Madonnas in Europe. And um, I re -brought, we were rebroadcasting that interview as well because the movie Chevalier is out that talks about Joseph, Joseph Boulogne, uh, Boulogne, who is also known as the Black Mozart. Okay. And he was uh, born in Guadeloupe. He was uh, half uh, French and, and half African. Um, but the the um, interview I did in, in that interview with Renoko Rashidi, he talks about articles that he was writing for AtlantaBlackStar.com. All right. Now, how's everybody doing today? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like uh, on this broadcast. Be sure to register uh, for this uh, online class. And we have the bundle pack on the homepage of our website, TheAfricanHistoryNetwork.com the African history network.com for uh, the online classes. So you get both online classes and you get bonus content as well. Uh, it's only a hundred dollars. It's a $300 value. Even after the course is over with, you'll still have full access. You can go back and watch the entire course. Okay. Or you can watch as much as you want to. All right. So we look at uh, different archeological discoveries that have come out in the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, there was a big discovery that came out in 2010, found on the Greek island of Crete, and they found uh, stone tools that date back at least 100, uh, 130,000 years ago. Okay, stone tools on the Greek island of Crete. Um, over the course of two summers, archaeologists say are at least 100,000, 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Okay, so uh, we go through and look at uh, discoveries like Tanis Heraklion, the lost city of Egypt, and there, there are at least two lost cities of Egypt. You have Tanis Heraklion, but you also have uh, Dazzling Aten, and Dazzling, Dazzling Aten was revealed in like the last couple of years. Uh, this article from yahoonews.com, sunken, sunken Egyptian city, reveals 1,200-year-old secrets, okay? So the, the, the British publication, The Telegraph, uh, reports that 150 feet beneath the surface of Egypt's Bay of Abu Kir, they found 64 ships, 16-foot-tall statues, 700 anchors, countless gold coins, and smaller artifacts. Archaeologist Frank Gaudillo uh, estimates that Thomas Heraklion was built around 8th century BC, around 8th century BC. Okay, so you're talking about uh, more than 700 years before Cleopatra VII was born. Now, these, these are some of the artifacts that were found at the bottom of the sea. All right. We look at different archaeological discoveries, and when these new discoveries come out, they're causing the scientists, the archaeologists, and the paleontologists to push the timelines back. And we keep finding out that based upon archaeology, we're, we're much older than we've been told. And Homo sapiens are older than we've been told. So Renoko Rashidi, Dr. Charles Finch, and, and other uh, African Center scholars have been saying that uh, uh, African people or Homo sapiens uh, modern man are not 75,000 to 100,000 years old, but at least 300,000 years old. This article from NBCnews.com came out June 17, 2017. We're older than we thought. 
new find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. Okay, we're older than we thought. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. So um, an excerpt from the article says that in all the news outlets picked up this story. They all have uh, New York Times, Washington Post, NBC, CBS, ABC, Associated Press, Time Magazine, uh, this, uh, uh, National Geographic. They all have articles on this. Modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought. Uh, researchers reported uh, new discoveries at a rich site in Morocco uh, show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals. Hunting and probably cooking game animals um, 300,000 years ago, which is 100,000 years earlier than what scientists have believed up until now. 100,000 years earlier than what scientists have believed up until now. Now, new discoveries and new dating methods show that, in fact, many of the bones belong to modern Homo sapiens and they lived as far back as 300,000 or 350,000 years ago. The earliest previous Homo sapiens bones date back 195,000 years ago, and they're from clear across the continent in modern day Ethiopia. All right, so uh, taken together, the findings show modern humans were dispersed across Africa long before anyone ever thought. And not only were we migrating from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Central Africa and West Africa much earlier than people thought, but we were migrating out of Africa and around the world much earlier than many people thought as well. Okay. So we go through and look at a number of archaeological discoveries. We look at the ancient African presence in Asia and in Europe, the African presence in Europe and things of this nature. Um, African people were the first Asians, the earliest modern human Homo sapien, Homo sapiens sapiens population of Asia were also of African birth. We're speaking of the diminutive, the, the diminutive Africoids, the short statured Africans, the extremely uh, important and much romanticized family of black people phenotypically characterized by unusually short statures, skin complexions that range from yellowish to dark brown, tightly curled hair, and in frequent cases, like many other Blacks or Africans, stetopegia, stetopegia, which means deposits of fat around the buttocks, or what we would look at as large buttocks, like Sarah Bartman or Sartre J. Bartman, okay, who was, who was koi, who was a koi koi, okay, uh, and we know in uh, the 1800s, she was put on display in uh, in Europe. OK, uh, and then she's going to become a prostitute. She, you know, she lived a, a horrible life. Uh, but this is Europeans fascinated with the bodies of African people and African people's sexuality and dehumanizing us at the same time. So um, they are probably more. Uh, these, these short statured Africans, the, these diminutive Africoids are probably more familiar to us by such pejorative or negative terms as pygmies, negritos and negrilos. Similar peoples who live today in southern Africa have been titled Bushmen, more accurate names uh, for these uh, latter for these uh, latter people are the San people translated as original inhabitants. OK. All right. So. Uh, we go through and, and look at this history. We look at uh, the Omex as well. And we deal with also the connection between Omex culture and the new Black Panther movie, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, that brought in the uh, uh, Latino uh, angle with making Prince Namor uh, Latino. And it dealt with the Spanish colonization of Mexico as well, because uh, Prince Namor is 500 years old and there's a scene where he goes back to when he was a child and you see the spanish colonizers con conquering his people and enslaving them okay so we go through and we we also uh this uh black panther 
the first movie and second movie deals with a lot of African culture and African history as well. Uh, Mandinka Egyptian Olmec connection. Uh, so this comes from page 82 of the first Americans were Africans documented evidence by Dr. David M. Hotep. We talked about this last week when I interviewed uh, Tony Browder. A major ethnic group among the ancient Egyptian Nubians were the Manding people, M-A-N-D-I-N-G, or the Mandinka, an original Niger-Congo homeland in the general vicinity of the upper Nile Valley is probably as good a hypothesis as any for the origin of the Manding. The proto-Manding migration had to have taken place during the African Aqualithic. Okay, now um, he goes on to say, when the Manding reached Central America and began mixing with the local population, they were labeled Omex. When the Manding, when these Africans reached Central America and began mixing with the local population, they were labeled Omex. The Omex was supposedly a mixture of the, Man, the Manding or the Mandinka and American Indians or Marins. A-M-E-R-I-N-D-S. Do not forget that the man, the Manding or Mandinka make up the base of the Omex. So the Egyptians, the ancient Kemetic people, the Kim, the, the Kimi Yu, uh, the, the, uh, the Egyptians, the Manding and the base of the Omex are related to each other. This is from page 82 of the First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. So we go through, look at history. We look at this history chronologically as much as possible. We talk about the Druids. We deal with uh, uh, the, uh, the Greeks and Romans conquering ancient Kemet. And the Druids are dealing with the watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, coming out of ancient Egypt. OK. Um, and we're going to see the Druids go into Ireland and take this information into Ireland as well. And this is who. Uh, a British slave named Patrick is fighting against and killing when Pope Celestine I sends Patrick into Ireland in 432 uh, Common Era AD to convert the Irish population to Christianity. And standing in the way of that are the Druids who are dealing with the Gnosis or the true knowledge, and they're dealing with a watered down version of teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, coming out of ancient Egypt. And he is killing the Druids and the Druids wear a helmet similar to the uh, uh, helmets worn by or uh, the, the headdress of Nesubites or pharaohs in ancient Kemet and they have an asp on them or a cobra, a snake, okay? So they were referred to as the snake people. And when we hear the mythology of Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland, First of all, Ireland is a is a cold climate and it's an island and there's no evidence. There's no archaeological evidence. There's no evidence whatsoever of snakes being in Ireland. So when we talk about um, Patrick driving the snakes out of Ireland, he was they were talking about the snake people who were called Druids. That's who this is a metaphor It's talking about symbolically. There were no snakes in Ireland. They're talking about him driving the, the Druids out who were dealing with a uh, watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. And then forcing Christianity upon the people. So we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe uh, by the Africans known as the Moors who are taking the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe. And this brings Europe out of the dark ages. They're taking the science and the mathematics and the art and the, and the chemistry, the periodic tables, the, the, the medicine, the, the surgical instruments, all this knowledge they're taking into Europe and they're Africanizing Europe to varying degrees. Um, and they're also intermixing into the European population, intermixing into the European bloodline as well. We know they, they lose their last uh, control, the last stronghold of Granada, January 2nd, 1492, in the, in the Spanish uh, Granada Wars. And Christopher Columbus is going to set sail August 3rd, 1492. OK, we look at things like the Tekken, which is a symbol of ancient, uh, a symbol of resurrection coming from the a story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus, okay, known as the first holy trinity. Now, some of this information may go outside of the circumference of your own awareness. 
just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Now, there were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu built in ancient Kemet, uh, but only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu uh, removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, London, France, uh, England, L London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The uh, Tekkenu, Tekkenu for plural, uh, the Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king of Sar. So if you read Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder, page 17, and this is one of the books we use in the class also, um, the, the Browder deals with this type of information. Now, you once again, you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class, but we use the books for, books for reference to document what we're talking about. And I show you excerpts of the book on the screen usually. All right, now, uh, when we look at Freemasonry, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire uh, to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term uh, child of light or sons and daughters of light, which was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of ancient Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or in a series of steps or degrees. So the concept of going to um, a institution of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of degrees, okay, associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, uh, PhD, etc. That that concept comes straight out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Okay, Kemet meaning land of the blacks. That comes out of the Nile Valley region of, of, of Africa. All right, now, uh, read pages 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. So we go through and look at this history with the, we deal with the black Madonnas and child coming from the story of Asar, Aset, and Heru, and Heru being born of a virgin birth on December 25th. And then um, the decolorized version of that story, and we st and we see the uh, white Mary and Jesus. Uh, we look at different Netaru, uh, the forces of nature, uh, the deities in ancient Kemet as well, like Ma'at. Um, we go through and uh, look at some of the history of the Moors. Uh, we look at uh, why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th, and that deals with astronomy. Uh, we deal with the film Black Panther. Uh, the, the Panther deity Bast comes from Bastet, which is a netter coming out of ancient Kemet. And Bastet was an ancient Egyptian goddess worshipped in the form of a lioness uh, and later a cat. She was a goddess of warfare and lower Kemet, worshipped as early as about 2890 BC during the second dynasty. Okay. Um, we deal with things like what the word Wakanda means. Wakanda is a real word. Wakanda basically means possesses secret powers. We see some different spellings of it. Um, but in Wisconsin, there is a Wakanda water park in Wisconsin. It's been there for years. There are schools named Wakanda, like in Nebraska. Okay. Uh, and we see Wakanda is uh, Omaha Ponca Sioux Indian and uh, uh, Omaha Ponca and Sioux Indian Native American word that basically means possesses secret powers. We go through and look at different uh, some uh, some ancient civilizations. We look at uh, Hannibal Barca and we look at Carthage, the Carthaginians who are descendants of the Phoenicians. And uh, we know Carthage is destroyed in 146 B.C. Uh, founded in about 813 uh, BCE, destroyed in 146 BCE by Rome. Okay, so we look at the uh, Punic Wars. Um, we deal with why Africa was not named after Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus. Uh, Africa 
uh, we consult Cassell's Latin English Dictionary 2002 edition, page 11, in the entry for a fear. It tells you that Africa uh, means of Africa or belonging to Africa. Uh, Publius Cornelius Scipio takes his surname Africanus. He takes that name after uh, he defeats Hannibal Barca at the Battle of Zama in 202, in 202 BC. So we deal with, you know, the Battle of Cannae, 216 BC. We deal with uh, Hannibal crossing the Alps in 219 BC, but also talk about the Battle, Battle of Zama in 202 BC. And then um, we, we know Rome is going to be the, uh, Rome is going to conquer uh, Carthage in 146 BC. And Carthage is in the area of North Africa that today uh, Tunisia is. Okay. We talk about ancient Nubia as well. And we look at some of these different African empires that Europe tried to claim as their own. They try to say these were Europeans. These were not African people. These were not black African people. The same way they're doing with Egypt, the same way they're even doing with Queen Cleopatra. And, and she was not Nubian. She was not full-blooded Africa, but she had some African ancestry, as Dr. Charles Finch just explained. Um, ancient Nubia, or ta uh, also known as Kush, as, as he talked about, and Kush is more of a, looked at as a region, as opposed to, say, a country. But ancient Nubia, also known as Kush, K-U-S-H, was a region along the Nile River located in northern Sudan, where the conflict is going on now, northern Sudan and southern Egypt. So the southern portion of what is makes up Egypt today and the upper portion of Sudan in ancient times, that was Nubia. Now, it was home to some of Africa's earliest kingdoms known for rich deposits of gold. Nubia was a major trading port for luxury goods that came from sub-Saharan Africa, such as incense, ivory and ebony incense ivory and ebony the first monarchy of recorded history was established in ancient nubia the nubians were also known for their exceptional archery skills that provided the military strength for their rulers kings of nubia or, or nasubitis or pharaohs ultimately conquered and ruled egypt for about uh, a century about 100 years Monuments still stand in modern Egypt and Sudan at the sites where Nubian rulers built cities, temples, and royal pyramids. Okay, so we go through and look at history like that. Then we look at the history of the Moors going into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal. They go through from Morocco into the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal. They defeat the Valens and the Visigoths. They settle in southern Spain and, and refer to it as Al-Andalus, Al-Andalus, which basically means to walk in the spiritual path or walk in the spiritual light. So, so who were the Moors? The Moors ancestors were known as the Garamantes, G-A-R-A-M-A-N-T-E-S, the Garamantes. These were a black African people living throughout North Africa. Hannibal Barca was Garamanti as well as St. Augustine. Now, George G.M. James in the book Stolen Legacy said that the uh, Moors were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. These teachings are going to bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. Uh, and we know that the word Moors derived from the Greek word maros, M-A-U-R-O-S, maros, which literally means black or a very dark color. Now, now, the Romans adopt this word and called them Mari, M-A-U-R-I. The Mari were a Northwest African people who were very dark skinned. The Romans will refer to the region of Northwest Africa as Mauritania, Mauritania. Mauritania is Latin and means the land of the black skinned people. You'll also see the word Marish, Marish, M-A-U-R-I-S-H. Now, Romans later adopt the word as a reference for the black skin inhabitants they encountered in Africa. Read pages 527 and 187 in Golden, of Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, which is one of the books we use in the class also. So we go through and look at this history of the, uh, of the uh, some of the history of the Moors in Europe. And we deal with uh, Tariq Ibn Ziyad going in in 711 AD, uh, defeating the Vandals and the Visigoths. But also we, we have to talk about uh, General Tarif in July 710 AD going in 
uh, with 400 foot soldiers and 100 horses uh, successfully carrying out a mission in southern Iberia. This is the reconnaissance mission, the reconnaissance mission in 710 AD to get the land, to get the lay of the land and understand what's going on, understand what they're up against. OK, uh, so we go through and look at some of the history of the Moors and what the Moors introduced into Europe. We talk about the decline of the history of the Moors as well, how they lost power. We look at the three great West African kingdoms of Ghana, Songhai, and Mali. Uh, we talk about the film Black Panther and relationship between T'Challa, who uh, is probably the richest man in the Marvel comic universe, and Black Panther, and uh, Masa Musa, who's the richest man in history, and there's an article from the History Channel, uh, history.com, uh, called the, uh, This 14th Century African Emperor Remains the Richest Person in History uh, from March 19, 2018. And it deals with the relationship between Massa Musa, who became emperor of the Mali Empire in 1312 AD, and T'Challa. Okay, and we know in the Black Panther movies, T'Challa was portrayed by uh, Chat, uh, Chat with Bozeman. Uh, now, West Africa is thriving in 14th century uh, common era A.D. at a time when Europe is ravaged by uh, a lack of resources and raging civil wars. Mansa Musa's rule came at a time when European nations were struggling due to raging civil wars and a lack of resources. During that period, the Mali Empire flourished thanks to ample natural resources like gold and salt. All right. Now, uh, we, we also had to talk about Christopher Columbus. Columbus is crucial to the spread of slavery and the laying the foundation for uh, racism, capitalism and the exploitation of indigenous people. Columbus never came to the land we call the United States of America. When you look at where he went on his four voyages, he goes into Central America. He goes into South America. Some he goes into the Caribbean. He, he never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he comes here is Cuba, which is uh, about 90 miles away. So we look at Columbus and uh, and then we look at the transatlantic slave trade also, okay? And go through and analyze the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, the widespread enslavement of diverse peoples for economic and political gain has played a fundamental role throughout human history in the development of nations. Ancient Greek and Roman societies operated by using slave labor, as did many uh, European countries in the, the modern period. As early as the Middle Ages, Mediterranean cities were supplied with Moorish black slaves from Muslim countries in North Africa. Okay, now, um, African slaves were brought to the New World shortly after discovery or uncovery by the colonizer Christopher Columbus. Uh, upon his arrival, uh, they, they uh, and Africans could be found on the island of Hispaniola, site of present day Haiti, as early as 1501. Upon his arrival in the Bahamas, Columbus himself captured seven of the natives for their quote unquote for their education on his return to Spain. However, the slave trade proper only began in 1518 when the first black cargo direct from Africa landed in the West Indies. That was because of the Asiento de Negros signed by uh, King Charles V of Spain in August of 1518. The importation of black slaves or African slaves to work in the Americas was the inspiration of the Spanish bishop, Bartolomeu de las Casas, whose support of black slavery was motivated by humanitarian concerns. Now, de las Casas travels on voyages with Christopher Columbus. And he writes, uh, keeps a diary. He writes uh, books about this. And um, uh, he, uh, I read two of his books in college, okay? Tears of the Indians, I think one of them was. But uh, De Las Casas writes uh, about the atrocities inflicted uh, on the, on the, uh, on the indigenous population there. OK, and he's going to insist on uh, he's going to suggest that uh, Africans be enslaved and to a lesser extent uh, white people also uh, early on. Now, De Las Casas argued that the enslavement of Africans and even some whites, proving that in the 
uh, early period, slavery did not operate according to uh, exclusive uh, racial demarcations. Would he, he argued that uh, they needed to stop enslaving the native population because this would save uh, the indigenous American Indian populations, which were not only dying out, but engaging in large scale resist large scale resistance as they opposed their excessively harsh conditions. As a result, King Charles V of Spain agreed to what's known as the Asiento de Negros. The Asiento de Negros, or the Asiento for short, uh, or what's known as a slave trading license. This was in August of 1518. This would later represent the most coveted prize in European wars as it gave to those who possessed it a monopoly in slave trading. So uh, it was a license for slave trading companies and they uh it, it was a license for them to uh provide spanish colonies with african slaves so we go through and uh look at uh history like this and we look at this history chronologically okay so uh you can register for this 12-week online class ancient kemet the moors and the maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school you can use this information with your children as well uh, we understand that African history uh, and culture gives us our foundation, it gives us our values, our interests, and our principles, and it influences our economic empowerment, it influences, uh, influences our self-esteem, our self-development, and self-worth as well. There are also studies that show how teaching our children African history improves uh, their performance in school, performs, perform, uh, it improves their academic work also. So this class is on sale $60, regularly $130. We teach Saturdays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to teach this class today, so you can register now, join us in class. And uh, we teach us at our online school, the African History Network uh, online school. On, Saturday, on Sundays, Black Resistance Movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. Same structure for that class, same price. Register for the bundle pack of courses. You get both classes for a uh, hundred dollars as a three hundred dollar value. There's also bonus uh, content that you'll get. You get five of my lectures uh, that will be in the video library for free. Also, okay. So, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Th uh, we had a great interview with uh, Dr. Charles Finch, despite the uh, technical difficulties. <laughs> Uh, remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. What kind of also you can support the African History Network dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App, and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. So the Celsius keep.